Hey fam, it's Rachel. Today on Crack Your Bible, I wanted to give you guys a quick travel update because I'm currently in Athens, Greece, and I recently left Rome, Italy. And while I was there, I went to a first century catacomb where they had believers in Jesus Christ interred there. And I saw that even though Christianity was illegal at this time and many people were persecuted for their Christian faith, these people had such hope in Jesus Christ and you can see that they were not afraid of persecution. And I don't see that in the church today. Instead, I see people who are fearful, they're anxious, and they say, oh, oh, I hope God takes me before I ever have to experience any of this stuff. And it's time that we need to look at the people who actually experience persecution and take a page out of their playbook. This is how Christians need to be. Now, before we get started, make sure you hit subscribe with the bell with the parentheses so you're notified of a new gospel message because of course, Satan and YouTube and Google are one and the same and they do not want you to know the gospel and they will never notify you of a new gospel message unless you hit subscribe with the bell with the parentheses. So let's get started. So I'm currently in Athens, Greece right now. It's a little after midnight and I had set an alarm while I was sleeping to get up in the middle of the night because the street noise here is unreal, you guys. It's really loud. And all day, because I can see the Acropolis from my room, it's just tour bus, tour bus, tour bus. You have people walking, you have people yelling, you have people like honking their horns. And they're rerouting construction down this street. So it's just so noisy. So I tried to film earlier and it was just like horns blasting. And it was it was a mess. So that is why the lighting's not good. I'm like no makeup right now. So just bear with me. So anyway, I do want to say thank you to everybody who uh, sent prayers my way while I'm traveling. And I really appreciate it. I know a lot of people have mentioned like, hey, I'm praying for you and your husband as you travel. And I appreciate it, but I'm actually not traveling with my husband. My husband's at home working still. He was not able to uh, take this amount of time off. I'm actually traveling with my younger sister. She wanted to go see Greece and Rome, but she didn't want to go by herself. She said like as a birthday present, she decided that she was going to take me on this trip with her. So I'm actually traveling with her and I do want to say like, thank you you guys for your financial donations and your support because that is helping pay to get into some of these sites that I'm going to. And, um, yeah, I wanted to tell you about some of this because unfortunately, a lot of these sites do not allow you to film, which is really disappointing because it's like you buy all this gear, you travel all this way, and then it's like, oh, you can't film. But um, I wanted to go to the Mamertine prison in Rome while we were there. We were only there for a day. But when we got there, they're building a train station. So there's just, everything's like fenced off. You can't get in. You can't go up to it. You can't like look into a window. And I, this was like the one place that I wanted to film because this is the prison that Paul was at while he was awaiting basically his death. We see that Paul, even though he's going to his death, he's still encouraging people. He's still sharing the good news of the gospel with anybody who will listen. And I want people to be like that. Instead of going to the Mamertime prison, my sister and I decided, okay, well, let's go on a crypt tour. Now, a crypt is where uh, the bones of people who have died are kept. And um, because there's not a lot of space in Rome to bury people because it's been used for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and it's a very small area of land, they basically take the bones of people after they die and you kind of like disintegrate. They'll put the bones in an ossuary box. So it's just a small like shoebox size box of bones. And um, they'll inter those today in like a mausoleum. But in the early 1500s, you had these people called the Capuchin monks. And these are the ones that would wear like the brown hoods and they, they wear sandals on their feet as like a loophole to the fence law that they created for themselves that, hey, you can't wear shoes, but they'll wear sandals. So anyway, it's all of these men who were capuchin monks who are interred at these catacombs. 
And it's really creepy. Like, I really don't like it. The tour guide is telling us about how he's not very religious, blah, 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 blah. So he's talking about how these Catholic monks are just really living their life out for the faith and they've taken vows of poverty and they wear clothes that have holes in them and you know they're not wearing shoes and they're barely eating all day and all they do is pray and then we got to the room that had the scourges now these catholic monks would actually make whips and whip their own backs as if they were jesus and they would punch holes into their hands and their feet and it was supposed to be like, oh, I'm suffering just like Jesus is suffering. And we know that the Black Death was spread because these stupid men would go from town to town whipping themselves and spreading the plague in Europe. And millions upon millions of Europeans died during that plague because these dumb people would go about showing their penance of like, oh, God's angry at us, so let me whip myself as if I'm Jesus on the cross, or they drag crosses everywhere, or some they'd reenact crucifixions. And it's all about, look what I can do, look what I can do. Oh, let me try to match Jesus' sacrifice. And to me, that is just so offensive because they trample on the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we see in their artwork after, you know, they showed us all of these different tools that they used to basically maim themselves. It's it's almost like they're the gathering demoniac where he's in the, the tombs cutting himself. Like this is demonic. You are not supposed to try to reenact Jesus's crucifixion where it's like, oh, let me show that I can also go through any of, this like terrible stuff that comes with crucifixion. Um, you know, Jesus went to the cross for us so that we didn't have to go through that stuff. And there is no way that anything that we could ever go through would even begin to measure up to the kind of suffering that Jesus Christ went through on the cross, not only physically, but spiritually as he took upon all of our sins, the sins of the entire world. He was blameless. We as a person... If we suffer, we're, we're dying for our own sin. He took our place so that we didn't have to pay for our sins because the penalty for sin is death. So when we say we trust in Jesus and then we go about trying to uh, use our own works to justify us, we say, Jesus, what you did wasn't good enough. And that's offensive. That is terribly offensive. But you see these people... They're under Catholicism, and Catholicism is nothing but Gnosticism. We see that in 1 Timothy, it talks about how they prevent people from marriage and how they prevent people from uh, eating certain foods. And we see this in the Catholic Church, you know, uh, priests aren't allowed to marry and, you know, oh, you have to give up certain foods for Lent and you can't eat meat on Fridays. They pray to the dead. Remember in Corinthians, it talks about how they talk about the worship of angels and you know it's it's so frustrating that there are people that actually follow the catholic church because catholicism is nothing but gnosticism it was the early church and then all of a sudden you have it branch off into gnosticism and that's what you get with catholicism i mean it is just absolute heresy it is it is satanic catholicism is satanic and it makes me frustrated because there's a lot of good people that are led astray by Catholicism. And there are some people who are saved who are Catholics. But there's a lot of people, just like in any church, uh, they are very devout. But all of these people are not saved because they aren't putting their faith in Jesus Christ. They're putting their faith in their works. And everything that they do shows that it's all about me, 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 how, how much I can give up and how much I can suffer. You know, the Bible talks about how these people, when they get before the judgment seat of God, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you because they're always talking about, look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. Instead of 
Look what Jesus did. You know why I'm saved? You know why I go to heaven? Because of what Jesus did. It has nothing to do with my works. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross. And I just see in this crypt um, and in this museum, it's all about works. The artwork is all about works. And you have these dead monks like uh, right around Mary pulling these monks out of purgatory in their artwork. And it's just like, what about the risen Jesus? Because they also, everybody's carrying around a bleeding and nailed Jesus to the cross on their little crucifixes. And we don't worship a dead Jesus. We worship a living God. Jesus conquered the cross. He's not still on the cross. He conquered it. That cross is empty. Because we serve a risen living God. And, you know, I don't see this in the Catholic artwork. And it was really frustrating because when we got down into the crypts, they took all of these bones and they made it into different artwork that was supposed to look like a room. So they'd like make a bed out of bones and then they would lay the mummified corpse of one of these cappuccine monks onto the bed and it was just so disgusting but you would see like they're always focused on works and it was just depressing to see that there are the bones of probably 3,000 men who just completely wasted their lives they could have wrote they could have raised Christian children they could have had Christian families that went out and shared the gospel with people but instead they're so focused inwardly on their own works to save them look how poor I can be look how many people I can take care of God look how much suffering I can put myself through look how much food that I can refrain from eating God um, that they were trusting in their own works and they weren't saved that's the problem. They they didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all inwardly focused. And it has to always be about Jesus. And I saw that when I went to the catacombs of Priscilla. And this was a different place. It was, you know, kind of a, a short bus ride down the road. But there was a villa in about the 100s. So right after... Uh, the Apostle John died on the island of Patmos. He's the only apostle that did not die for his faith as far as being martyred. He died of old age. So this catacombs housed over 40,000 people. And these are basically just like niches that are carved out of the rock. And they put the entire body into the wall. So you would just have these bodies all just in the wall and then they would seal over it with like clay or cement that would have like the person's name on it or if they were wealthy they would have like a marble stele that would kind of like close up the enclosure so you weren't just like seeing bodies hanging out but um you could also have private family catacombs that were dug out so it would be like a small room that would have like all family members inside and those rooms were painted and they were plastered over painted with different scenes and what I saw is that in the oldest part which is basically the very first level you see constant paintings of bible stories or bible histories as somebody else pointed out to me because these are actual things that happened what's so interesting is that these people lived at such a time that their parents or grandparents possibly could have spoken with the apostles. They would have seen them face to face. Some of them possibly could have even seen Jesus because we know that multiple times a year, everybody had to go down to Jerusalem. So if they were converted Jews in Rome, uh, there was times that they were in Jerusalem at the same time that Jesus was because we know that there are uh, three different times of the year that everybody is required to go to Jerusalem and we know that Jesus died on Passover and that is one of the the required times where everybody has to be in Jerusalem who was a Jew at that time so their family members possibly could have been at Jesus's crucifixion which is just insane that you're seeing like hey these people lived at this time so 
they knew what it was like to be a Jew and then convert to Christianity. They knew what it's like to walk down the street and everybody's worshiping other gods. They know what it's like to just be surrounded with paganism and just demonic activity. But you see in these crypts, None of the paintings are showing Jesus on the cross. You see Jesus as the good shepherd. You see Jesus resurrected. You see the promises on the wall of every single time that Jesus said that he would be with us. There was a time where they had Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael in the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, and Jesus is there with them. I mean, these are Old Testament stories, and yet we see that every single piece of artwork is pointing to, hey, Jesus is always going to be with you. No matter what you go through, Jesus is always going to be there. It's like when your family would go in to see your crypt or to inter another person, they would be reminded of these stories. Hey, no matter what we go through, Jesus is always with us. Uh, Jonah was a big uh, favorite of the artwork in these catacombs because, you know, Jesus said that when these people ask for a sign, none would be given but the sign of Jonah. Remember, Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and then it spit him out and he went into Nineveh. And Nineveh was like a really evil place. But because of this, the people of Nineveh repented and turned to God. And we see that with the world People are really in an evil place, but because they saw a resurrected Jesus, they turned and they followed him. And it's just like, no matter what we go through, we see that Jesus is always with us. And it was just exciting to see these same stories. It's like it really resonates with you that these people are are reminding you of the same stories that I know. And They lived 2,000 years ago. And it's like, hey, I know that. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're trying to tell me. And it was just really exciting to see the hope and the faith and the joy that they have in knowing that Jesus is true to his word. And he's always true to his promises. And they worship a risen Jesus. They worship a conquering king. Not somebody who's still on the cross. And at no point was anybody like painting pictures of themselves, like showing, oh, look, these are all the things that I did. Look at me. Look what I've done. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what God has done. It's all about what his promises were. And, you know, I just find it so exciting that these people could have this kind of faith when they were living in times where it was illegal to be a Christian. It was illegal to practice Christianity. They would have been the odd ones out. They weren't participating in these sacrifices, which were intrinsically linked to everything that you did. There was no like, oh, I'm a secular person. No, everybody was religious. Like this was just part of daily life. And I found it really interesting that our tour guide made a comment and he said, you know, Rome didn't care when slaves became Christians because most of the people who were Christian or were converting to Christianity were slaves in the Roman Empire. And slavery, unlike in a lot of places and a lot of different times in history, was not based on your race. It had nothing to do with your ethnicity. They were equal opportunity (laughs) slavers. So, uh, and slavery was a lot different because it was like for a set period of time, you could buy your way out. There was no, you know, being a slave for life wasn't really a thing. So, um, it was really interesting that you have people from all walks of life. They're all different colors, uh, you know, all different backgrounds and they're all slaves and they're all becoming Christians. Rome didn't care because it's like, eh, whatever, they're the workers, whatever. And then the women of Rome. So we're talking about people who are actual citizens. They're not slaves or maybe that they're just living in Rome, but they're not slaves, but they're also not citizens. Um, you know, these women were becoming Christians and Rome eh, still didn't care because women, whatever. Um, but the tour guide said it was when the men became Christians that all hell broke loose in Rome because 
if men became Christian, men weren't participating in the civic sacrifices that were going on in the city. And if you don't have men participating in these sacrifices, now it's a problem. Now it's an issue. And that's when Rome turned on Christians. And Rome had an issue when all of a sudden men weren't taking part in these festivals, in these holidays, in these sacrifices, because number one, they wanted everybody to be of one mind. But also, this is a money-making business. Sacrifices and religious statues and uh, just everything related to these pagan cults uh, is a money-making issue. And this is why we see that the people who were idol workers would get so upset at Paul for having people convert because they made a good living off of all of these uh, statues that they were making, all of these pagan items that they were uh, making, that's how they had income. So Rome had an issue when men stopped participating in this stuff because it severely hurt their income. And we see today, you know, our holidays that are pagan are money-making businesses. And that's why people get so mad when all of a sudden you say, hey, I'm not going to partake of this kind of stuff. Like this hurts businesses' bottom line. And I'm here to tell you that there are businesses, there are companies that specifically are like PR firms where they uh, advertise to churches to push certain products, to push certain movies. You can even get whole sermons based around uh, movies where it's like they want to promote a certain type of movie. So they will send you pre-made sermons. Like, I don't think Christians that just go to church understand all of the crazy marketing that happens within a church. That's why they want you to do the Halloween and the Christmas and, you know, all this stuff because it's a money making business. And when all of a sudden you say, Hey, I'm not going to do this. All of a sudden it's like, Hey, you're hurting our bottom line because these they don't care about God. I mean, there are some people that are ignorant of these things, but for the most part, a lot of these people, they're just chasing after the dollar. And, um, you know, people, when you, whenever you touch their money, they're going to have a big problem with that. But um, we see that these Christians, even though they were harassed, they were outsiders, they were basically criminals for practicing their faith, they we're not afraid of dying because even in death, all they could point to was look what Jesus did on the cross. Look what he did for us. And just what a difference it was between the early church and the Catholic Capuchin monks. Like the Capuchin monks lived in a time where, hey, the Catholic church is really running everything. They're running the show. And do they use that freedom to preach the gospel. No, instead they, they turn in on themselves and everything's about their own personal works and they don't even have a personal relationship with Jesus. And it's all focused on like Babylonian Mary worship. And it's all about, Hey, how can I save myself? How can I, um, show that my works are good before God? Whereas the people who were actually persecuted living as foreigners, basically in this world, in this, you know, idolatrous world, it had nothing to do. Like none of their artwork had anything to do with like, Hey, look what I can do. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. It was all about, look what Jesus Christ has done for us. And these are the promises he's made. And if these promises were good, we know that the promises that he has in the future are also good for us. And I found that really exciting. But anyway, that's all that I wanted to share with you. I hope you will like subscribe and share it and I will see you later. Bye.